Right, so I was thinking, we've spent a fair bit of time on the house now. Um, we haven't got much done, considering how long we've spent on it. But we've spent a fair bit of time, so maybe today can be the day that we actually start to work upon the church. So obviously this is going to be um, part of Baptist Town. I don't know what we're going to call it. I think Norman had some suggestions. Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, none of you probably know who Norman is. That's to be fair, no one knows who he is. But anyway, <sighs> what am I missing? So I think he had some suggestions in the comments or something like that. So I don't know, we'll see. But yeah, so the, the, the thing, the basic idea is we're going to have like, oh, that's the tree farm now, by the way. That's what it looks like. I'll show you. I raised this up by two blocks, so now I'm getting six highs. And I'm breaking the leaves on them so I can get some more saplings. But um, basically, I want to have like a province full of different denominations within a particular tradition. So tradition and denomination are, aren't the same thing. At least not the way I use the word. So, for example, independent fundamentalist Baptists and Reformed Baptists quite different in terms of their uh, certain beliefs um in fact they probably wouldn't like each other that much uh, let's say they i'm a reformed baptist but the um ifb crowd certainly wouldn't like us reformed baptist people so these are two different denominations but they do come from the same tradition from the same baptistic tradition so i want to have like different baptist churches i might put the ifb and reformed baptist like right beside each other because i think that might be funny so i was thinking Considering I have all this land up here, I was thinking of leaving it natural, but I might just put the church up here. But now that I'm up here, it's not very wide, and I want a bit of a wider space to have the church, so... I suppose I could leave this bit natural, and then... Put the church over here, maybe? Yeah, because it's only going to be a small little church. It's going to be the Reformed Baptist Church. Yeah, we'll do that. Start putting it down. So I think today, we might talk about, basically... What makes a good church? Uh, there's a lot of different ideas around this, like what makes a good church. Um, some people say, for example, that it should be a beautiful building. Others say it just needs to have good um, Bible teaching. Others say, oh, no, it needs to be young and hip and cool and what have you. So I'm basically going to run through a list of things and say, well, here's what I think really makes a good church. Here's some things that are nice but optional. Um, and then here, you know, here are some things that actually make a bad church. So number one, and I think this is the most vital thing for a church, is the right preaching of the word of God. Now, the, this can be done in two different ways. You know, the Bible can be preached in two different ways. Um, or there's two different, sorry, um, separate methods that can be done together uh, in terms of Bible preaching that I think are quite good. And that is exegesis. And where do I want this to be now? I think... Back to here. I think I might just make it out of wood. So usually when I've made this church, I've made it out of like um, concrete, but I think I'll make it out of wood. So the two things are exegesis and systematic preaching or verse by verse preaching. Sometimes, now these two things are done so closely together that sometimes whenever you hear people talk about exegesis, usually they mean both in one. So they'll say, well, we do exegetical preaching. And what they mean is we do exegetical preaching and systematic preaching because that's generally how it uh, how people do it generally speaking the people who actually want to you know do the bible properly do like exegesis um will m usually also do uh verse by verse preaching now this isn't always the case for example spurgeon i believe he was an exegete as well he was not a systematic theologian he did not go through it he did not go through books like start to finish. And that's what it means, by the way. Systematic theology, um, preaching is just verse by verse. So it's going to chapter one, verse one, and just continuing on from there. It's what I do on my uh, main channel, which for those who don't know, this is my secondary channel. My main channel is actually a preaching channel where I preach through the Bible exegetically and systematically. And I mean the Bible, not just particular books. What I'm doing is I am going from Genesis to Revelation. I think we'll start the church about here and... What should I make it out of? Should I make it out? Should I just make everything in this town out of oak wood? Yeah, why not? Be a bit boring, a bit bland, but sure, whatever. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well, I guess. But yeah, so what we're doing in my channel is verse by verse preaching. I'll need a new shovel in a minute. Verse by verse, there we go, preaching through the Bible, starting from Genesis 1 1 and just going onwards. Um, now we're taking our time, we're taking it slow um in in a few respects number one in that it's usually about once a week that it'll be uploaded it's been a bit less than that lately just because i'm busy 
And we're also taking it slow that in that um we don't do oh no the tree is growing nice. We don't do like the doors over no, where am I going? I'm going here. I don't I say we I don't do um like a chapter at a time. I will do like a verse at a time. In fact I think my average like verse per message is like one point nine verses per message. For example, I um I just finished um chapter three verse one which I did in two messages. Now these are half hour sermons and I did um I did Genesis one one in seven messages. So yeah, so we I, I like to take it slow. But you know some people take it fast. Someone who I'm list I like to listen to it would be Skip Heitzig. He's a Calvary Chapel guy, so he's someone I'd have a lot of disagreements with. Um in fact he so a lot he likes to bring up Calvinism. Not too much. He he rarely brings it up to be fair, but the times he does bring it up he tends to I think mischaracterize it, although he does seem like a decent fellow, so I'm guessing he just ha- it, it has some misunderstandings about it. Um, but so he he's not a Calvinist like I am, and yes, I I will even though I'm a Baptist, I will refer to myself as a Calvinist. Cry about it. <laughs> but anyway, he's not a Calvinist like me, but he does you know systematic expositional theology. But he takes the Bible like a chapter at a time. But I think that's fine because he does it well. He still manages to get what he needs to out of the text and. You know, he feeds his flock and so on. Um, whereas other people like John MacArthur, again, would be someone I listen to, someone I'd have more agreements with. He takes it an awful lot more slowly. Um, and then I guess there's people just in between. And I'm going to need some more food in a minute as well. So how... Let's see, I want the door to be about here. I'm going to have a hallway then. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll go 11 wide, why not? Yeah, so, but these are all different, you know, ways of, um, and speeds of preaching through the Bible. But they're all still preaching through the Bible. It's not just, you know, um, the pastor wakes up one morning and is like, today I want to talk about X, Y, Z. You know, and that can be done properly, but it's often not, unfortunately. So that would be systematic theology, whereas uh, expositional um, preaching would be, you just take a text, whether it's, going verse by verse through a book or it's a text you picked out for the topic within it just going taking that text looking at the context looking at you know everything that needs to be looked at and preaching it rightly um and like i say spurgeon is an example of that now generally speaking like i said this isn't always the case but generally speaking um the people who do where do i want the door i'm kind of basing this off my own church this will do for now the people who do um topical preaching mostly and look most churches will do a little bit of topical preaching here and there it would be very rare for a church to just do every single sunday um verse by verse um like my church doesn't my church i'd say 99 percent of the time we're going through a book but every now and again there will be a topical message for one reason or another um but the churches that i'll let the pig out one the churches that do mainly topical they very rarely do exegesis. They usually will just do something stupid with a text like misunderstand or misrepresent it and so on in order to get a particular point across. Um, so they won't go to the text and see what does this mean. They'll go to the text and see how can I make this say what I want it to say. And that's a terrible way of doing um, Bible preaching. Actually, someone else I've been listening to um, is Bishop Mary. He does um, expositional uh, systematic theology as well which is cool now he's a syrian church of the east so he's not baptist or even protestant but still i i think he's decent um so yeah one of the biggest requirements for a church in my opinion would be the right preaching of the word of god it doesn't have to be systematic um though i like as long as it's ex- exegetical it doesn't have to be systematic Oops. but i think that is the best way to do is just start with a book and go all the way through but there are good ways of not doing that like with spurgeon um so that's one thing that i think is an absolute requirement if the pastor is not rightly preaching the word of god well then he almost certainly doesn't properly understand the word of god if he doesn't understand the word of god he's not fit to lead a church so i was fortunate god led me well, i say fortunate blessed I, I use words like lucky and fortunate sometimes but what i really mean is um blessed which Look, just you get what I mean. And so I was really blessed by the Lord. He led me to a good church that did, you know, every Sunday, verse by verse, through a book. Um, so that is that is an absolute requirement for me. 
Another thing that people often um, like to look for would be beauty. They want their churches to look beautiful. Now, this is a nice thing when possible. However, it should not be a requirement, in my opinion, for the simple fact that um, I just, you know, like it's nice, but it, whether it's a beautiful church or not a beautiful church, it doesn't determine the quality of what you really need, which is the preaching of the word, uh, the fellowship, the sacraments and so on. Uh, you know, like, look at this. So this is church is definitely not going, now that I look at it, this is definitely not going to be a beautiful church. But hey, if this church were to have existed in real life and it w there, you know, would have been um, right teaching, sacraments, etc., I think it would have been fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a beautiful church is, is not uh, a necessity. It should not be a requirement for anybody. But some people make it a, requir a requirement to like a ridiculous degree. Um, like some people will just like turn their noses up at churches if they're not beautiful, which I really don't appreciate at all. Uh, I think it's just so ridiculous because especially um, like especially being in Ireland, there's just they're like there's no Protestants in Ireland, basically. All the beautiful churches are Catholic or they're old Church of Ireland church. Oh, I'm no, I'm not dealing with those. I uh, know they're old Church of Ireland churches that just aren't used anymore. They're you know. There's very few um, really beautiful churches, but like I understand the appeal for a church. And if a church is beautiful on top of other things, like it has a beautiful building on top of other things, that's obviously a bonus. That's, you know, I won't turn my nose up at that. But some people I think are just far too almost snobby about it. Where it's like, no, it has to be a beautiful church. Where it's like, if it's a beautiful church and the pastor is a heretic and it's flying a rainbow flag, the beauty isn't going to help you. Because at that stage, it's it's barely even a church beyond the building. So, yeah. I, I don't like people who are just so certain. No, a church has to be beautiful. It doesn't. It's nice if it can be, but it doesn't have to be beautiful. Uh, another thing, because I mentioned the sacraments there a minute, but another thing that I think is an absolute requirement for a church, as in, if it doesn't do this, it's not a church, is the sacraments, is the um, the Lord's table and baptism. Now, obviously, I have a different view of baptism than a lot of people um, would being a Baptist. In fact, I have, a, I have a different view, generally speaking, than most other Reformed people. And yes, once again, I am lumping myself in with the Reformed in general, even though I am a Baptist. And if you want to cry about that, please feel free. <laughs> I, I like I like uh, the idea that I'm annoying Presbyterians. But anyway, where are the chairs going to be? I think I'll have them. I'll have a gap here then. Okay, so one two three four so i can have a door here good stuff uh oh no i want to put the floor here but yeah so the, the sacraments that has to be something that's that's done if a church doesn't baptize and doesn't do the lord's supper it's it's failing its duties as a church that's just one of the things the church has to do it would be like if the church didn't preach now in terms of like the frequency of the lord's supper obviously i believe personally i believe you only do a baptism as a you know, when someone makes a profession of faith, if you're Presbyterian, it'll be whenever a child is born into the church, whatever. Um, different denominations will have different views on that. My church does the Lord's Supper every Sunday, which is something that I greatly appreciate and I'm very happy about. Um, and I think it is something that churches should do. Now, my church is a small church, so I do understand it's a lot easier for us to... Um, do the Lord's Supper every Sunday because we've not got that many people. I don't want to give too many details away about my church, but still, I guess I'm a bit private. But um, there's a beehive over there. Okay, not going over there. But um, I understand that, like in say a really really big church, that oop, I don't know why that's so laggy. Um, you you couldn't really do the sacraments every Sunday. I get that. Um, I'm not really a big fan of massive churches anyway. If if they're able to be run well, like I'm sure John MacArthur's is, then that's grand. But generally speaking, I think it's just good to have a nice little church where kind of most people would know each other. Um, and you don't run into problems like, you know, not being able to do the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But, um, yeah, so I understand with a bigger church, you can't do it. They probably can't do it for logistical reasons every single Sunday. I, I, I understand that. I do. Um... But I feel like if a church is able to do it, they really should be doing it as often as they are able. If not every Sunday, then maybe every second Sunday or at least once a month. 
I've heard of churches that only do it um, like once a year and that's just shocking to me um it, it like you know and, and generally speaking those churches will be baptist because you know we uh, we don't have the same view of the sacrament and so on and i get that but even though i i and i say i don't believe i am looking i'm going to start looking more into my view of the sacrament so they could change but even though at the moment i don't believe um the sacraments actually do anything like say the presbyterians and so on would believe uh, I they are still important. I do think they should be done, at least, you know, at least as often as the church is able. So that's another thing is the sacraments. Now, one thing because I just seen how long we've been going already. One thing as well that um, that church I think shouldn't be doing, but that a lot of churches try to do, is try to stand out by how different they are. They try to be like, oh, we're not like your grandmother's church. Or I think Bill, uh, no, sorry, Phil Johnson, the, the, the good Johnson, the good ill Johnson, not the bad ill Johnson. I think F Phil, yeah, MacArthur's friend, he told the story of um, he, him getting like a, a thing in the post saying, come to our church. It's not like any church you've ever seen before. And he went there and it was exactly like every church he's ever been to because they're all the same at this stage. It's all, you know, a concert with a motivational speech um don't like a church shouldn't be trying to be different a church should be trying to be godly you know that should be the church's goal is glorifying god in all that it does and in, in the entirety of the service it shouldn't be so much of the, i think modern day churches is just you know for the pastor's own ego um it's it's not about worshiping God. It's not about giving Him glory. It's about essentially glorifying the man behind the church, and that man, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, is not Christ. It's whoever started that particular church. So a church shouldn't be trying to be set apart from other churches in terms of, you know, being all new age and so on. I will get my spuds as well now. A church should be set apart from the world because of how godly it is and how holy it is and how well it adheres to the commandments of God and how well it preaches the counsel of God, the word of God. That should be what sets your church apart. It should be set apart from the world because of how similar it looks to all other good churches. And I'm going to make myself some more tools as well. So, yeah, don't... If your church, um, like I don't want to just judge too harshly. If your church looks like a concert with a motivational speech, you probably shouldn't be there. Now, again, if it's like the case that this is church is the only decent church in your area and they do some kind of new, like um, big Eva things like dimming the lights for worship and all of that stuff. But generally speaking, it's a good church. It's, you know, it's biblical. It's sound. The pastor is actually a godly man who preaches the truth of God. If it looks like a worldly church, but it actually behaves like a Christian church, I give it a pass, personally. If it's doing the essentials, then yeah, I give it a pass. Um, but generally speaking, those churches aren't doing the essentials. Generally speaking, those churches will abandon pretty much any part of the Bible they don't like because they're trying to be worldly. They're seeker sensitive. They're trying to appeal to people by making the gospel something that it's not um now i want to build a lectern as well is that what it's called a lectern i think so maybe not um hmm what's it called then Or it's something like this. I thought it was called the lectern. That's odd. Anyway. Um, also, I've lost my train of thought now. Oops. I don't think it's going to show it to me because I don't have a, a book. So I'm going to need to get a book. But yeah. One last thing I'll talk about before we go, the music. Uh, again, I'm, I don't want to be too persnickety about the music, but if it's all contemporary stuff, that's probably not great. 
I'm sure there is good, in fact, I know there is good contemporary worship music. So I'm not saying all contemporary music is bad. Some people act like because most of it's bad, then all of it's bad. In fact, I've seen that. I've seen people like write off um, anyone who might defend any kind of modern music as just bad or whatever. Like, like some people get really persnickety about this or really uppity and sort of, you know, turn their noses up at it. If the music is good, I don't care what time frame it came from, but chances are, if it came from the modern day, it's not good. That's just the unfortunate truth of it. Now, if it's modern and it's good, then it's good. We should accept it. And I think that I wish more people would start working towards that and start actually trying to make good worship music in the modern day. But a lot of people don't. They're happy to stick with the old stuff. And the old stuff is good. So, um, you know, I don't mind sticking with it, but I wish there was new stuff that was also good. So, yeah, that's... Some things what a church should have is it should have the right preaching of God, the word of God. It should have the sacraments administered um, whenever possible, uh, as often as it can. It should have godly leadership. That's another thing I didn't get into. It should have um, theologically good worship music and it should not be trying to look like the world. So, yeah. Thank you guys for watching. Goodbye and God bless.